Good evening and welcome to the State Journal Register offices in downtown Springfield for this live mayoral forum with incumbent mayor Jim Langfelder and challenger Frank Edwards. I'm WMAY's Jim Leach with Bernie Schoenberg of the State Journal Register. The rules of the uh, forum this evening, we will have 90 second opening statements from each candidate. We will alternate the order of questions and each candidate will have 90 seconds to answer each of those questions. If a candidate references his opponent by name, the moderators have the authorization to offer a rebuttal period to the other candidate a brief rebuttal period, we will close with 90 second closing statements. By order of the coin toss that was held just before the start of the event, Frank Edwards will give the first opening statement for 90 seconds. Frank Edwards. Well, I'd like to thank WMAY and SCR for um, hosting this forum and allowing us to come here and explain uh, questions to you. I've been in Springfield most of my life except for the military and for college. Um, what some may not know is I'm a licensed, trained airline transport pilot, uh, journeyman firefighter, small business owner. In my training, we are taught to recognize, react to, and solve problems. Because if we don't, something serious can happen. And it's with this in mind, I'm watching my hometown lose people, lose jobs, property values are going down, high crime, quite frankly, headed in the wrong direction. I could no longer stand by and watch. I know it wouldn't be easy. The decisions will be tough, but I know what has to be done to move our city forward. I was in the mayor's office before when times were tough, and with no excuses, we moved the city forward. That's why I'm standing up again, because I have the experience, the knowledge, as your mayor to move the city forward in the right directions that will bring economic development and jobs to our community. Thank you. Now a 90 second opening statement from Mayor Jim Langfelder. Good evening. Thank you to the SJR and WMAY for giving us the opportunity to discuss Springfield's future. In 2015, I decided to run for mayor because Springfield was at a crossroad. The city had a structural financial deficit and we could do better. CWLP facing potential bond default. Oak Ridge Cemetery operating in the red, rising police and fire pension fund payments. Under my leadership, the city council made tough, nonpartisan decisions, and we overcame these challenges together, saving millions of dollars by eliminating early retirement spikes and renegotiating the coal contract. At a time when government was being downgraded because of no state budget, our proactive measures were rewarded, going from a negative to a stable outlook for CWLP. We cut expenses and reduced headcount. We achieved class one fire department rating. We completed the long overdue 11th Street and Stanford Avenue extensions while doing over $160 million in sewer street and sidewalk improvements throughout Springfield, creating over 1,200 jobs. We funded Oak Ridge Cemetery with Hotel Motel, Lincoln Library with Telecom, and police and fire pension payments with sales tax revenues. Now Oak Ridge Cemetery is operating in the black, Lincoln Library expanded its outreach services, and we are in a better position to fulfill our future pension obligations. We have given people a voice in our city government through our ward plan meetings and open doors of opportunity. Under my leadership, Springfield now has a more stable foundation. We will continue the momentum by building on our community strengths and work together so all of Springfield will continue to improve and thrive. I'm Jim Langfelder, and I appreciate everyone's vote on April 2nd. Candidates, thank you. Now to the questions. The first question will be posed by Bernie Schoenberg, and we'll go first to Mayor Jim Langfelder. Thank you, uh, and good evening. Thanks for being here. Mayor, the Springfield Police Benevolent and Protective Association Unit 5, the union representing more than uh, 200 uh, Springfield police officers, this weekend endorsed Frank Edwards, saying they are in contract arbitration with the Langfelder administration. There's a poor labor climate and inconsistent decision making in the department. Is their concern legitimate, and what are you doing about it? Well, with regards to uh, that particular endorsement, uh, when I first came in, uh, Chief Kenny Winslow, we, we did public forums to ask the public what they'd like to see with their next police chief and actually how the police department should be run. And from that feedback, we went through an arduous process and I selected Chief Winslow. I do the same again today. He has my full faith and confidence. Really, the negotiations is about residency. I'm a firm believer in residency because property taxes, all of our property taxes go to play police and fire pensions, and then some. And so that's one of the sticking points. With regards to other negotiated items, that's something that's done through Corporation Council, but the uh, police chief, you cannot have second to none of someone that's built the community trust 
and really engage the community in working with the police department to help reduce, especially our violent crimes, by 30 percent uh, since 2010. Uh, Mr. Edwards? Well, I think there are legitimate concerns uh, from the police department. Um, they're the people out in the street that know the streets the best. They understand that we have high crime. And if you were able to look at a map of our city, um, I think in the last two weeks we've had over 275 um, incidents of crime in our community. It's amazing. These people know it best. They don't feel the policies are in the best interest of the city. And, and the police department themselves, and they're looking for leadership to head us through this time where crime is on the rise, and we need to stop it. And they understand it, and they know I'm serious about it. I'll now ask a question to uh, Frank Edwards. The Illinois Association of Chiefs of Police and the Illinois NAACP have adopted a list of 10 shared principles about how police and community relations should go, including treating all people with dignity and respect, rejecting discrimination on several grounds, including color, immigrant status, and sexual orientation, and use of de-escalation tactics to cool confrontations. Should Springfield adopt those 10 principles? Absolutely. Actually, we have a news conference tomorrow that you know about. And we're going to talk about I didn't about know what it was about exactly, but anyway. <laughs> okay. That, that uh, discusses that very thing and lays out a plan that if you look at our plan, we went and counted. We meet every um, one of those principles that the NAACP has, has laid out. And we're kind of shocked that uh, the Springfield Police Department's on that list and, and the, Springfield, um, or the uh, Springfield Park District's on that list and the Springfield Police Department isn't. Um, it was a thing that was a joint effort on everybody concerned, and we were really surprised when we saw we weren't on the list. Mayor Langfelder? Uh, yes, this is an item I spoke with the chief about uh, with regards to 10 principles, and really what it comes down to is communications. I mean, I think that's one of the issues PBPA had was communications. So the chief's real diligent. He's worked hard to build the community trust. We've done it through the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement officers. We've uh, worked with uh, Bob Moore and others really to take a look at how we can build the trust within our community. How can we p support our police and uh, police men and women of our department? And we've moved forward in that direction. That's one of the initiatives that came through with the uh, Chiefs Association. So uh, what Chiefs is going through right now is making sure we have best communication so we can have buy-in from the rank and file because you have to have buy-in from the rank and file because what's on a piece of paper won't matter unless everybody truly believes it. Chief Winslow truly believes and the command staff and a lot of our law enforcement officers understand community policing Springfield's way and that's what we'll move forward to together and uh, in a relationship with all our community partners. Next question goes first to Mayor Langfelder. Taxes have become a significant issue in the campaign. Will you, and to Mr. Edwards as well, will either of you take a pledge not to raise taxes or fees over the next four years? And will it be possible to roll back any current tax rates during that time frame? Mayor? Well, one tax uh, rate that which should be rolled back is the uh, Capital Township. I'm a firm believer that it's time for that particular uh, governmenting body go, uh, you know, be replaced through operations, through efficiencies with the city working in conjunction with the county. We're trying to work through that. But the main goal is to provide property tax relief while you provide the services to our residents. Springfield is the boundaries of Capital Township. So that's how that should go. But with regards, we made the tough lift. Like I said, we uh, had a structural financial deficit. Just ask Director McCarty with regards to our pensions keep going up. We've uh, taken that corrective action and we've allocated specific taxes, mm -hmm. hotel motel, to Oak Ridge Cemetery, a most visited, second most visited cemetery in the country. Telecom goes to library with regards to uh, sales tax pensions. So I don't see any need to raise any further taxes because I've done the heavy lift where others would not. Is that a pledge on four years yes. in no taxes? Uh, and Frank Edwards. I can't see us raising taxes, but I think the real question you're asking is, is Springfield physically responsible, fiscally responsible? And from my vantage point, I don't see that it is. Um, if you take the Diger grant that the city applied for, and when they received notice, um, they applied for 14 million. When they received notice that they were only going to get 10, they wrote back and said, if we can't add the whole 14, we don't want any. Well, you know the story. We didn't get any. So that's 
fiscally irresponsible to do that. Um, if you look at um, buy donut signs, if you look at buying a building and then going to give it away um, right out of the get-go, those are things that you can't do and expect to be fiscally responsible. Those are things that um, when you raise taxes on people, they question why. So if we're not doing those kinds of things and we're doing better than most, then I don't see a need to have those taxes. <clears throat> The other side of the budget picture is on spending. In what areas, if any, of city government do you plan to reduce spending over the next four years? Please be specific. Frank Edwards, to you first. Well, I think what you have to do, Jim, is you have to do a um, job audit, um, and we'll work our way through the budget line item by line item like we did when I was in the mayor's office last time. We had expenditures of almost $113 million. When we got done, those expenses were down to $103 million and you do it um, by audit, and you do it with uh, the people at OBM that are trained to do this stuff. You give them ideas, you ask them if it'll work. But those are the things you have to do. You have to be fiscally responsible with the people's money, and right now, we're not. Mayor, areas where you could see spending being cut the next four years? Well, we've tightened our belts quite a bit. Actually, we're operating at a 20-year low with regards to headcount. Uh, with regards to spending, what we're doing right now is shared services, where you're getting rid of the duplicative efforts uh, across department lines. For instance, in accounting, uh, we're moving those individuals underneath the Office of Budget and Management uh, as much as possible, so you share those services across all department lines instead of having one accountant in each department. But really, uh, we're going through the integrated resource plan. That's where you'll see a significant change. Dalman 31 and 32 are going to come offline sooner rather than later. And with that, we're going to work with IBEW and the individuals that have a stake in it with our residents and really roll out a fiscally responsible plan for our future energy needs. But through that whole process, it's about how do we right-size utility for our future jobs with regards to energy. To the mayor. Um, <clears throat> to Mayor Langfelder, and we'll continue talking about CWLP as you just did. Um, if you had your way, what percentage of electric power for the city should city water, light, and power generate, and how much generation should come from coal-powered plants, and what percentage should be purchased from the open market? Well, uh, what we will do is talk to the state legislature because they're looking at uh, environmental regulations, and we have a coal-fired power plant. Dalman 4 was built to the 2030 standard, so that's what we have to be most concerned about, and how do we move forward to that? That's one of the reasons we went with solar energy. It really uh, uh, dipped our toe with regards to that because that more outlines our needs here locally. Uh, as we move forward to the future, though, we used to sell directly to our businesses and our residents. Why it went high is because the $60 million power marketing debacle, now we have to sell everything into the grid and buy it back. So we're getting 90-some cents on the dollar and that spiked everything up. But through this integrated resource plan, once it's in place, we will be proactive and uh, really laying out the strategy as we move forward with regards to those energy needs. So it'll be a balance. What's the proper balance uh, with the future holds? That's what the integrated resource plan will provide us, that strategy as we move forward together. Frank Edwards. Well, we've asked for that plan, and he keeps quoting it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's kind of an unfair advantage, but if you look at CWLP and you want to work with your partners, your employees, your stockholders, which are the rate payers, and to come to a fine balance. And I don't think it's any secret 31 and 32, the oldest units, do need to come offline um, so we can be more efficient. When they come offline, that takes us into do we need like two? Because the city water light and power uses a lot of, of water. But I think. The main thing is, is we concentrate on what we have, and that's the coal plant before we start talking about renewable energy. Let's put CWLP on a fiscal um, plan that makes it stable instead of jumping back and forth between solar, um, batteries, whatever the case may be. Let's get our coal fire plant up and running, get it stable where it's paying its bills, and then we'll move on to renewable energy which is going to be in our future. But we can't keep hopping back and forth from one to the other. We need to do one first with a short-term plan, with action plans to accomplish that goal, put a long-term plan in place so that we can see our renewable energy uses down the road. 
but you can't hopscotch back and forth like we're doing now. Still on CWLP and to Frank Edwards, um, both of you have discussed your views of a backup water source, the need for it or not, or what we should do, but I'd like to review that tonight. Um, you know, please explain what you would do to provide water long term for Springfield if it's a, a second lake or not, or, or an alternative to that. Well, we have, we have a good lake. Um, we keep talking about a second source. We have a good lake that we need to maintain. If we take 31 and 32 offline, your water uses from the power plant will go down because Dolman 4 is a closed system, doesn't use as much water. Um, we now have low flow toilets that we didn't have when this first got going. We have low flow showers. We're losing less water than we used to use before. So this lake, Hunter Lake started when I was 16 years old. I'm 68 today. We still have property to buy. We still have sanitary um, systems that need to be moved, which are a great expense. I think we look at maintaining what we have, um, making it better, um, put us on a dredging program for Lake One, uh, Lake Springfield, and doing those kinds of things that will conserve and not um, continue to put an additional cost on the CWLP and the rate pairs at the time where we can't afford it. Mayor Langfeller. Well, unfortunately, uh, the alderman did jump back and forth when he's on the council. We were close to having the permit, but then they went to the wild goose chase of looking at gravel pits. Gravel pits were ruled out a long time ago. When they purchased the gravel pit, as treasurer, I wrote a memo at that sitting council and, uh, you know, actually, you know, saying, bringing up issues that might be related to that expenditure. But as we move forward to the future, Water is a resource for our future. You cannot survive without water. We're the backup source for a lot of our communities, the only source for our communities, but we don't have a backup supply. We've supplied Chatham three times water so they wouldn't have to uh, boil water, so we're their backup. We cannot conserve our way out of uh, drought, so that's why it's important to go the route. We went ahead with the Army Corps of Engineers, did the studies again, uh, and we came back to the same two solutions, the Havana Pipeline and Lake Two. Well, to go 50 miles with the Havana Pipeline, it's, we just completed 11th Street. We went a quarter of a mile, took us 50 years to do that. And so Lake Two is where it's at with regards to that reliable source of water as we move forward uh, with regards to that. Now to the issue of infrastructure. Studies in the past have suggested that Springfield isn't spending enough to maintain, much less improve our roads, sewers, et cetera. How much money should be put toward infrastructure needs annually in Springfield, and where should that money come from? Mayor Jim Langfelder, first to you. Well, we've been, we put in $160 million in infrastructure these past three years, thanks to the proactive council. Uh, you know, Mayor Houston took that proactive measures. I don't believe uh, the alderman voted for the funding source of that. So even though you like to have new roads, you have to vote for the funding source. And that's what, it's tough for, to be, uh, not politically correct. You want to do the correct thing. That's what's best for Springfield, making those tough decisions. That's what it's all about when you're in the mayor's seat. And that's what uh, Mayor Houston had done with that funding plan. So we are seeing the benefit of that. As we move forward, uh, you know, we have video gaming that's helped in that regards, and we've been good stewards with regards to those projects. We've improved lake roads, but uh, we've also been the only city to receive two Tiger grants and a Bill grant for the railroad consolidation. And so we're moving forward. Those projects, uh, you can talk to Hanson Engineers, they came under budget, and we've moved forward exponentially to meet that 2025, uh, uh, 25, 20, 2025 uh, goal to move the tracks off 3rd Street to the 10th Street, and we hope to do that through the capital plan of the state of Illinois. Frank Edwards on infrastructure? Infrastructure's a mess out there. I mean, everybody knows it. You drive down some of these streets and they're filled with potholes and it's probably worse this year since we've had uh, colder weather than we've had in a long time and ice and snow. We know that. But when I was on the council, we, we floated a bond issue because we had a revenue stream to pay for that bond. We we're the first ones. And we, I think the first year we spent $30 million and started working our way toward an infrastructure plan, which is definitely uh, seriously needed. And I think at that time we used uh, the gaming money toward infrastructure. That was, that's, was the purpose of, of it. So we're moving that way and we're headed that way, but we have a long way to go. Um, 
it seems the more we have, the more we have to build, and our roads are getting older and older. And we have to have a, to come up with a steady plan and a set amount to move the city forward. So infrastructure is at the top of the list, not the bottom. Frank Edwards, you referenced a moment ago the purchase of a donut sign, which is intended to be part of a planned Route 66 corridor in Springfield. Uh, can you uh, talk more about how you would take advantage of Route 66 as a tourism opportunity? Would you pursue the corridor idea or have other ideas for how best to uh, take advantage of that opportunity? Well, one of the things that I asked for when the, when the sign um, arose was, let's see the plan. Everybody talked about a plan. To this day, I haven't seen the plan. Um, I'm sure the media has asked for the plan. We haven't seen it. All we did was purchase a sign, and then we started talking about a corridor. Um, I'm all for Route 66. There are a lot of people that that um, come in as tourists in Route 66, but without a plan, you're not going to go anything. We can just buy a bunch of trinkets and set them out there, and that's not going to attract anybody. So. I think if we get together with um, the Tourism Bureau and have them lay out a plan for our community to see and lay it out for everybody to understand, then we could have a discussion about what would I do or what I wouldn't do. But with, with no plan or no direction and no budget, when we use um, the tourism budget as a candy jar just to buy things that make no sense, and people don't like that when there's no plan and they see a $22,000 purchase when they've had their taxes raised, family members hired. They don't like that. They want to see a plan. They want to see the direction we're going when we buy something. Mayor, what is the plan for Route Well, actually, there is a plan. Mayor Davlin had one uh, with the interpretive uh, Route 66 uh, Discovery Center. And so there's it, uh, it outlines the whole corridor throughout the whole state of Illinois. So we're coming up on the 100th anniversary. Now's the time to get ready for it. We met with Senator Brady and uh, others, legislative leaders, along with the county, myself, the EDC. We went there, and that's one of the uh, asks that we had. You know, let's commemorate the Route 66 corridor. So there's a plan in place. Uh, it's a matter of let's put plans into action. And that's what I get uh, focused on is as mayor, I don't get, I don't uh, worry about who gets the credit. I want to get things done. And that's what we've done in a number of ways. But specifically with regards to the private sector, motorheads, if you have not gone out there, go out, motorheads on uh, off the Toronto Road exit. It's a great stop for everybody. A sign company with their memorabilia. The donut sign adds to that experience, and that's what it's all about. We did Abe's Hat Hunt just this summer, and it connected our historic sites, and it directed people to sites that they wouldn't go to, like Rachel Lindsay Home and other ones, and they saw it upscale a visitorship. We're going to do the same thing with the Route 66, uh, and we'll put the sign strategically wherever that might be. It does have a tie into The Simpsons. I think someone said, hey, The Simpsons had a donut. And so uh, we'll tie all that together, but it's about how do we get people to visit, enjoy Springfield a different aspect other than Abe and stay an extra night to the mayor mm -hmm. um, it's not uncommon to see people speed up at yellow lights in Springfield and go through red lights <laughs> should traffic enforcement to combat such violations be stepped up well, one thing we've uh, just had a public forum on is our traffic modernization. And that's where we're going towards where you can actually synchronize the lights. I think that's probably why frustrated motorists tend to do that. And uh, through the synchronization, all be through technology. We're uh, moving towards a smart city. So uh, once that does take place, downtown will be the first aspect of it. And then at nighttime, you've seen them in other communities where they have the blinking red lights so you can yield uh, during the middle of the night. Uh, that's what this will allow us to do through the Centrax system. So we're moving towards that type of system. But uh, with regards to enforcement, you know, uh, the police, men and women of our police department do a, a great job on a day-to-day -day basis. and. Uh, uh, we, we need to improve our technology, so we do synchronize the lights once and for all, for all using our technology. Mr. Edwards. As much as I hate to break, break a Springfield tradition, but yeah, you have to enforce that. It's just unsafe. You can't have people doing that. Um, in regards to how we put the lights up or how we sync them, you can't have people doing this stuff. Um, somebody's going to get seriously hurt, and they have, and it just can't be tolerated. 
I will now direct my next question to Frank Edwards. Uh, labor unions have been big donors to campaigns, also represent many people in Springfield, do a lot of work. What is your relationship with unions, and what should the city's relationship with unions be? I've always had a good relationship with unions. I've always had a good relationship with non-union. Um, my relationship with the union was always follow the rules and follow the law and enforce them. No more, no less. And, and they look at me and go, um, when we talk about economic development, their members aren't working. And they see 600 jobs leave our community. They see people leaving. They want something done. And they want that turned around and that course set in a different direction. So my relationship with the unions is good. In fact, they've endorsed me. Um, and a lot of it is let's follow the law and let's put our members to work with um, economic development jobs. That's what's more important to them is getting people to work and uh, so they can help our economy roll. If they're working, they tend to spend money in our community. So they've never asked me to do anything above or below the law. It's always follow the law and um, that's all they've ever asked. Mayor Langfelder. Uh, I get along with everybody. That's why I'm warm and fuzzy. <laughs> but uh, with regards to unions, I mean, really what you're seeing is a hierarchy. They make the decision, um, you know, and that's what it comes down to. And as mayor, you, I, do, I represent 115,000 plus people, and that's what it comes down to. And uh, I haven't made everybody happy with regards to that. Uh, case in point, uh, last election, people wanted me to uh, say who I was going to keep. Well, I, I wouldn't let that out. I said it's really about how the mayor directs the city and moves to the future. And so Director Mahoney, he was one that uh, one of the current labor unions uh, didn't like. I kept him because he's everybody's favorite alderman or uh, director because he was an alderman. And so same with Chief Winslow. We're talking about that today. It's not about how they've handled things. Uh, they've represented the city well. That's why I keep them. If I didn't like them, I didn't think they were really doing that customer-focused service to the citizens of Springfield, I'd replace them. But they're doing yeoman's work. Uh, they're running their department well with regards to serving the public. We're a government of the people, by the people, for the people, and that's what it's all about. And that's what we do, whether you're in a union or non-union. I was city treasurer for 12 years, never had a grievance. Never had a grievance, and that's almost unheard of. And I had both union and non-union uh, workers working side by side, getting along, and that's what we're going to do throughout the entire city of Springfield government. This is News Talk 94.7 and 970 WMAY Springfield, W234CC Sherman. Live coverage of a mayoral debate between incumbent Jane Langfelder and challenger Frank Edwards, jointly sponsored by the State Journal Register and WMAY. Our next question goes first to Mayor Jim Langfelder. What's the biggest impediment to economic development in Springfield right now, and what would you do to correct it? Well, the impediment has been two years without a state budget. I mean, that was devastating for a uh, state capital. Uh, it set us way back. The medical community had over $100 million worth of projects put on hold uh, because they were owed a quarter of a billion dollars of uh, back payments. And so that stalled our development. It was taking off. One of the first ribbon cuttings I went to was the Learning and Innovative Center over at Memorial Health Services with SIU. And all that came to screeching halt. Now it's like starting up the train engine again, and we're moving in a positive direction. How do we do that? By working with the Land of Lincoln Economic Development Council, with the private sector that drives economic development, the small businesses. Small businesses are the backbone of any community. That's why we did Justine Peterson. It's a microloan program when the state didn't have a budget. I called in all the banks. We asked them to uh, support the program with a microloan fund. They did do that with over a million dollars, and we made 80 loans, small business loans, totaling close to a million dollars. So that's how we get, work together to get things done. Frank Edwards. High taxes, high utilities, um, high crime, the reputation of um, Springfield being tough to do business in, tough to build in. Um, those are the kind of things that prevent people from looking at us, from bringing in new companies, from providing jobs to our, to our citizens. So I know we're going to hear about we've had economic development with LRS. That's homegrown. We're going to hear about Brandt, I'm sure. We're going to hear about the YMCA. It's already here. When you ask me that question, I assume you're asking me about new development, new jobs new companies, 
coming into our community. When they look at us, and our utility rate is almost double the national average, they're not gonna come here. When they look at us and, the, and we, our taxes are not stabilized, and they gotta worry about up and down, and, and us having high taxes, they're not gonna come here. So we have to stabilize our taxes, lower our utilities, get our crime under control, and, and put that out there, and, and use Economic Development Corporation um, that was formed between the county, the city, and private sector to sell our city. We have to give them something to sell. And right now, it's tough for them to sell because companies are doing their due diligence. Your time is up. To the question of the Economic Development Corporation, the city now contributes $250,000 a year to that public-private partnership, the Land of Lincoln EDC, designed to lure businesses to the area. The city also has an Office of Planning and Economic Development. Should that city function remain and why? Frank uh, Edwards first. It, it shouldn't remain. Um, one of the things that was done, there was a study done in January of 2017, and it's basically stated that you can't have confusion on where companies are to go to get information about our city. And it said there can only be one speaking for our community. And when you have two, that adds to the confusion. Our economic development at the city should be rolled into community development. Um, let economic development be handled by the professionals. And these are people that's been hired to sell our community and it, when you're selling our community, it's much more than just a slick brochure. It's professional people that bring people to the table for jobs, and we can't be in their way as amateurs. The city has a part to play, and that part is get your crime under control, lower utility rates, stabilize your taxes. And if we do our part, the Lincoln Land Economic Development Corporation will be able to do their part and bring companies and jobs to our community. Mayor? One of the proposals I had when they were looking at the uh, Economic Development uh, Council is not only do we pay $250,000 uh, to that initiative, but also we pay $180,000 to regional planning. And people don't think Springfield has a planner. We do. It's called regional planning, and they have uh, you know upwards of over 10 people, I do believe. But really, planning and economic development go hand in hand, and that's what we should have combined those offices. We should have moved them out into the private sector, maybe over the medical community, so they can really thrive on the uh, target industries that we're trying to attract. You know, that's health and wellness, financial services, information and technology, as was mentioned, LRS, arts and entertainment and education. Those are our target industries that we need to go after together because our greatest spokespeople for Springfield are right here in this room and outside listening. I mean, when you go travel and you have those connections, it's all about personal relationships and how do we develop that together. And economic development, our Office of Planning Economic Development, they have a crucial role, role to play because we receive federal funds for low income and moderate income areas. Uh, that's where community development comes with community development block grant funds, our TIF dollars, and really developing the inner city, our inner core, because what we don't want happening is what's happened to our health department. We gave that away, and so it's a siphoning off of city resources, and now we cannot get the good customer service that we deserve within our own city limits. Uh, to the mayor, uh, on, on the economic development front, just this afternoon, the uh, Springfield Economic Development Commission uh, approved uh, a proposed hotel and entertainment complex at 4th and Washington Streets, mm -hmm. 10 stories tall, a bowling alley. Uh, is this a good use of what would be more than $7 million in tax increment financing funds? Well, the financing has to be put in place, of course, but uh, it's a great project for downtown Springfield, uh, something that magnitude hasn't been done in over 40 years. And so uh, the $7 million that you're talking about is generated through that development. So it's their own property taxes that they would generate. Uh, the ask would be the dilapidated parking ramp that the city owns. And then the other piece would be, I think, uh, $400,000 to uh, purchase the remaining parcel that's needed for that development. So that's really how a true public-private partnership, how can you work together? But the best way to do it is to make sure the city's interests are protected. 
And I always go to bat for my corporation counsel because you couldn't ask for a better attorney to draft contract language better than he has. If he was the attorney back when uh, the wind contracts were entered into, that would not have happened. When the power marketing debacle happened, that would not have happened. That's why I have my full faith and confidence in how we go forward with the integrative resource plan. We're not going to be pushed into a rush to judgment. We're going to take our time and actually draft the contracts, draft the agreement, draft the strategy forward for our future energy needs so we can really use the utility as an economic driver for the city of Springfield. Frank Edwards, your opinion of the fourth in Washington project and more than seven million over time in TIF backing. If it's a private development, I know at one time we, we limited uh, private development to 30% of the project. So I'd have to see the budget out project to make sure that that is what we're talking about. Um, but anytime you can bring development downtown, especially private development downtown, and they're going to pay taxes on that development, I think that's a, that's a good thing. Okay. Uh, next question, and I'll start with Frank Edwards. Back in 2011, um, the city council voted 8-2 to two to make it a civil rights violation for groups that lease land from the city to restrict membership. The reason this was passed was because two clubs at Lake Springfield had men-only membership policies. You uh, were one of the two no votes on the council, saying the city had other ways to prevent discrimination. Was that the right vote to make? Yeah, I think it was because we had, we had their lease in our hand that we had the opportunity to change that lease anytime we wanted to. And I felt that's the way it should have been handled and not a blanket uh, across the board. Um, because you do have good clubs out there that, that do have women membership. And, and you're kind of attacking all clubs when you do that. So I think the best way to handle that is when you think something can be changed and it can be changed in a private uh, way, you don't throw the whole city or the whole, whole uh, everybody under the same blanket. So I felt that we had the right to do that with the lease, and that, that should have been the way to handle that. Mayor Langfelder, your thoughts on that issue? Well, I'm glad they all came to the 21st century because that's what's needed. And one, what I think, might have been the Elks Club. I'm a member of the Elks, and actually they have the first uh, female president of the uh, exalted ruler, I should say. And that's what it's all about. How do we uh, put aside our differences and work together to get things done? And that's a key component uh, you know, with membership. And so that's what we should always focus on is how we can work together uh, for the betterment of a club or for our city and move in that direction. Do you think the ordinance was appropriate? Uh, I would have to read the ordinance as far as that goes. Okay. 2011, that's a long time ago for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Richard. <laughs> Next question goes first to Mayor Langfelder. Uh, the issue of crime has come up periodically throughout this campaign. And depending upon who you believe, crime has either gone down significantly in recent years or remains very high for a city the size of Springfield. You've talked about this issue. You've talked about your faith in the police department. But what is your plan to reduce crime in the neighborhoods that are most significantly impacted by it, Mayor? Well, one thing I th think we all can agree on, Springfield is not more dangerous than Chicago. I mean, that's what some of the reports say, which is, uh, you yeah, it's not true. But with regards to what we've done is uh, focused deterrence, and that's is one of the initiatives that uh, Department of Justice had uh, touted. It's a data-based, evidence-based uh, process, and it's working with the community and to improve uh, outreach with regards to we're using SIU uh, Carbonell. They've gone door to door. Uh, they've ga engaged the public with regards to crime. They've uh, interviewed police officers. How do we combat crime? And that's how we work together. They've identified youth opportunities, things of that nature. So we've done summer youth initiatives. We received an AmeriCorps grant with regards to $100,000. And we're partnering with the outlet, Boys and Girls Club, Computer Bank, Good Guides. Uh, and that's how we work together to really intercept uh, and provide better opportunities for our young people so they don't take the wrong path. And that's what focused deterrence outlines in that initiative. The other thing we're doing is an ad another database uh, or data-driven initiative is ShotSpotter. We're partnering with Memorial Health Services, St. John's, HSHS, they're each putting in $50,000 because they know the importance of not only helping individuals within those target areas that have the high crime, but also so our law enforcement uh, men and women are protected. When they go into a gunfire situation, they'll know uh, what type of weapons could be used, whether they're automatic or what have you. But that's a private-public partnership that we're working for together on. Frank Edwards. Sorry. Um, it's not me out here saying there's crime. It's the SJR. 
it's WMAY, it's Channel 20. I mean, I'm looking at the news reports that you guys are putting out. And then I go look at them and study them. And, and we do have a high crime rating. And, and, and the, it was interesting to watch the um, police department come back and say they reduced crime by 42%, but they went back all the way to 1995 for their statistics. So you can play games with statistics if you want, but you guys reported the news. I looked it up. We do have a crime problem. And tomorrow, you'll be there, hopefully, and we're going to lay out an initiative for crime. And it's a five-step program. And you have to have the department buy in. It can't just be the city. It can't just be the citizens. It has to be the police and the police union. And we talked about that. And the end result is they felt we could do a better job. And the police union endorsed us. So there is crime out there. Candidates, you both talked about the need for more proactive policing. The mayor's referenced focus deterrence, and uh, Mr. Edwards, you have talked about perhaps having police uh, bring in people who uh, they know have been offenders in the past, bring them downtown just to have a talk with them. However, issues like disproportionate uh, stops of minority drivers and in some communities stop and frisk have raised civil rights concerns. How do you balance the quest for more proactive policing with the rights of individuals in their dealings with police? This goes first to Frank Edwards. Well, I think that if you look at the statistics you just said about minority stops, nobody should like that. There shouldn't be one person in that room that thinks that's the way we should handle it. But when you do proactive policing, you go out and have a reach out to the neighborhoods. You have a reach out to the homeowners associations. They're, they have to buy into what you're doing. You have to let them know what you're doing and where you're going and why you're there. It, it, you just can't show up on a doorstep and say we're here. It's a long step to get where we need to be and you just don't do it overnight. Um, it takes a while to get there. But you have to have a plan. You have to have a short-term plan, a long-term plan, a vision of where you want the department to go. The vision the police department has today is over 20-some years old. It needs to be modernized and brought up to date. And then our, our patrolmen have to buy into that. We can't do what we're doing today and just hodgepodge of how we're doing. You realize we have no officers that have been to the FBI Academy in six years. And, and we have a free opportunity to do that. That's leadership, that's network, that's how you get there. And in six years, we've sent nobody there to learn new ideas, new techniques. That's almost criminal that we're not taking advantage of that kind of training. Where you have 250 people at one time. Mayor? Yeah, the uh, training's nice, but really we're into action, that's why uh, I think Alderman Edwards supported the body cameras that we were one of the first communities to implement body cameras and that was to protect not only the public but our police men and women and that's where we move forward with that direction. The HOT, Homeless Outreach Team, that came from an initiative where we're partnering with SIU School of Medicine, Memorial Health Services, HSHS. They've gone door to door to assess the well-being of families in Enos Park and now they're working on the Pillsbury area. But the Homeless Outreach Team was an initiative that came from the grassroots, from the men and women of our police department. They brought the idea, Chief Winslow saw the value of it, we're implementing it, where we're working together to provide those support services for the homeless men and women of our community. And that's what it's all about. How do we move forward? But in answer to your question, we met with the ACLU, and that proves the level of trust Chief Winslow has built in our community. Just look around to any city where disaster happens with their police force. Kenny Winslow's built the level of trust. That's true leadership. And he's done that, and what they want is fair justice. We met with the uh, ACLU. We're working with them. We work with the NAACP, Noble, and other organizations to find out how we can provide better services and provide fair justice across our entire city. How do we work together as a community to provide the protection that each men and each individual of our community desire? Uh, to Mayor Langfelder, uh, Governing Magazine's recent study found that medium income of an African American household in Springfield area is 42% of medium uh, income among white households, the largest discrepancy in the nation. Would you work to close the gap and how? 
definitely work to close the gap, but uh, with any study, just like the crime studies or the population loss, I should say, the population <laughs> loss and the jobs uh, moving out, they look at the metropolitan statistical area. They'll say Springfield MSA. Well, that is Menard and Sangamon County. And what we're seeing is other cities, there's an influx of people moving into the urban area. And Springfield's no different. The rail tracks, the first point is you have to admit there is segregation with regards to that. Uh, railroad tracks, rivers, those were put up as barriers. We just uncovered the uh, race riot site of 100 years ago. So we will move forward by developing both sides of the track uh, through our intermodal hub, and that's one of the grant initiatives we're moving forward with. And then the other one is connecting our resources economically, core areas. And one core area I've identified is Chamberlain Park, underutilized, Comer Cox Park, underutilized, and we have the Gold's Gym that's occupied as Salvation Army Community Center. We have Boys and Girls Club. That's our young pool of talent right there. We need to bring our recreation, our technology, our arts and business resources, private and public sector, working together to maximize our greatest resource through those investments, our children. Thank Edwards. I'm not sure what was just said, uh, but. <laughs> Economic development, jobs in all parts of our, our city. Um, it gets back to we need to stabilize the taxes. We need to lower utility rates. Um, we need to get our crime under control. We're not going to get people to come into our community and invest if we don't do those things. And, and our weakest link is our weakest link in economics on the east side. And we have to spur that through economic development. We have to spur that by providing jobs. Um, we can't wish this away. We can't hope it goes away and goes somewhere else. We have, to, we have to do a better job. And this is the city doing their part to make it better. It's the city doing their part to say, we can lower utility rates to, to get people to come in. We can lower the negativity on crime rate to get people to come in. We can stabilize taxes so people aren't afraid that every other day we're going to raise taxes on them. It's economic development and jobs. That's how we boost everybody in our community. This goes to Frank Edwards. Is the city of Springfield making the best of its status as state capital? Do you want Governor Pritzker to do more for the city, and how would you get that message across? Well, I think we do. Uh, we're doing a poor job um, right now. Um, it comes back to what I'm sitting here saying. I, I sound like a broken record, but we have the opportunity ourselves to move the city forward. Um, we may be too dependent on the state to solve our woes, and it's easy to blame our problems on the state. We need to move beyond that. We need to move beyond where we're, we're bringing in jobs, where we're attractive to companies. We sit. Bernie, right in the heartland of the United States. We have good roads. We have a great airport. We have higher education. We have, um, we just raised 1% sales tax to help modernize our schools. Those are the kind of things that attract people to our community. Those are the kinds of things that we need to do. And if we can't do that, it doesn't matter whether they're state capital or not the state capital. People aren't going to show up here. I mean, I, I'm glad the state's here. It's an added bonus for us. But when we blame all our problems onto them, onto the state, that's way too easy when we're not taking care of our problems. Mayor Langfeller? Well, that's what I love about city government. We're nonpartisan. We move forward in that fashion. And kudos to Governor-elect J.B. Pritzker. He, uh, we were able to meet, and he talked about that very issue. How do we raise the level of uh, importance with the capital? And first point is the mansion. He said he's going to change the governor's mansion like it was in the Thompson era, where you're actually getting things done uh, with activities, things of that nature. Of course, hopefully having a university presence on that Y block is crucial. But we'll, we'll have a great working relationship. But what I'm most excited about is Lieutenant Governor's initiative that was announced where they'd provide funding for community colleges for workforce development. And so that's a key component because uh, we utilize Lincoln Land Community College. Uh, that's where we utilize a lot of the individuals when we put $160 million worth of street sewers and sidewalk repairs, they drew from that work pool. 
And what we also are doing is with Popular Place. It's a $20 million development, the old Popular Place. We're going to redevelop that to a uh, single family housing entity. But the most crucial part of it, we're partnering with Calvin Pitts, a bone training center on South Grand, putting others to work in those type of crafts jobs, teaching them the crafts of the future with regards to electric, uh, plumbing, and carpentry, and helping with that initiative. And that's an 18-month initiative. Once it's done, hopefully they'll be able to join a union or they'll be able to find employment uh, or start their own business. Mayor, you said the magic words, the Y block. Uh, we <laughs> talked about it for a long time, but it remains a, a, a large vacant space right now. Mm -hmm. So what's your latest thoughts on what can best fill that and what will it take to get there and in what time frame? Well, I think it'd be immediate. I think uh, with the university presence, uh, what's uh, delayed things uh, as far as that goes is certainty. I think that was brought up. You have to have certainty. And without a state budget, there's a lack of certainty. And so the universities rely on state funding. And so that's a key component. I've had uh, discussions with Chancellor Cook. They're interested in uh, expanding the Innovate Springfield. When the Q5 initiative went by the wayside and they're contemplating what to do with the EDC if they're going to create it, the city of Springfield stepped up with $100,000 worth of funding for three years. And that gave UIS certainty to come downtown and partner with Innovate Springfield. So now they're running it. Now there's the opportunity to expand to the Y block. Or if uh, Senator Menar uh, can work the magic with SIU in collaboration, or my preference, UIS is my alma mater, so that's my preference. But uh, the other side of it is to have an open green space with water features in the summertime, lighted water features, and then also uh, ice skating in the winter, activating that space uh, with activities all year round. But the university presence will bring that automatic population influx into uh, downtown Springfield on a regular basis. Frank Edwards, your plans for the Y Block? Well, half of it, Jim, is um, designed so you can't build anything on it anyway. Um, you have major sewer trunks going through there that was completed uh, a couple years ago. So you can't put buildings on that half of the Y Block, which now that leads you to the north half. And kudos to Andy Menar, Senator Andy Menar. If he can, if he's able to bring um, and and put forth a budget like he talked about, um, it's up to us to enhance that and say what can we do to help make that happen. How can we make it easier to build in Springfield? How can we make it? E how can we work with you instead of making it more difficult to build? Make it easier to build. How can we, as building and zoning? step up to the plate and help that process instead of making it more difficult. So I, I see great things happening there, but it takes leadership, foresight, and somebody pushing to make sure that it happens. And in four years, nothing has happened. You know, I'll, I'll take that back. We had a wiffle ball game there. And the city won. <laughs> <laughs> One of the uh, ideas talked about recently for downtown Springfield is changing some of the one-way streets to two-way. Give us your big picture overview of how to make downtown more user-friendly for motorists, bicyclists, pedestrians, whether they're traveling through or parking to stop and shop. Frank Edwards, do you feel? You know, that's one of those things, Jim, I think you, you, you look at as a team instead of just one individual throwing their ideas out there. Um, I never really thought, I'm so used to the one ways, I don't know whether an old guy like me could get used to the two ways. But I do believe we need to have free parking to stimulate businesses downtown, make it easier to build downtown. If you go downtown right now, people have built on the main level, they've remodeled the main level, but you look above it, there's no construction going on. Um, the way you do that is you make it easier to build. We, we should do what St. Louis did take the historic district, change the rules, because as the rules are right now, you got to make the same rules as if you were building out west of town something new. So bring in the historic district rules like St. Louis did, not unsafe, but make it easier to build and remodel downtown and spur development into the downtown area. As it is right now, we spend a lot of time making it more difficult to, to remodel downtown instead of making it easier to build downtown. So if we can generate that, make it easier to build downtown, um, combination of free parking 
and I don't know whether the one-way streets or the two-way streets is going to spur development downtown. I think the jury's still out on that. Mayor? Yeah, that's uh, what I mentioned before is traffic modernization. I leave it up to the professionals, which are the engineers, and the traffic changes have taken place. So really, for I talked to a small business owner downtown just the other day, and he said, I'll never uh, uh, locate on 6th or 5th because it's one way. And he said, I want uh, people to see it in both directions. So 5th and 6th are not the ones we're looking at. It's 4th and 7th Street and uh, making those usable. But it's all about connectivity and how do we move people around. And one key component is the downtown TIF. We went through a historic double extension of the downtown TIF. No other city had achieved that. And what's that meant for Springfield? The Bicentennial Plaza that the realtors, city partnered with them. That made that possible. The underground water storage tank under the Y block. That made that possible. That whole Jack Street corridor was made possible through the downtown TIF extension. The buses are finally moved over to uh, Ninth Street, that corridor, so that freed up bus safety. It's moving the YMCA to Enos Park and connecting Enos Park to downtown through that fitness center. And that was all through the downtown TIF being extended. When people didn't think we could get it done, I went to the state capitol, we got it done working together. And that's what it's all about, to improve Springfield. But we are going to leave it up to the professionals, offer their opinion. We do get feedback from the public, and we'll move forward in the best direction that's possible. Speaking of working together, Mayor, what kind of relationship should the mayor have with aldermen, and do you have it? Well, I have it, definitely. <laughs> well, you look at uh, the, the initiatives that we put through. Uh, I did bring my, uh, uh, you know, my handout, but we've accomplished a lot of great initiatives together. Uh, sure, we've had hiccups along the way, but that's the checks and balance of it. That's what it's all about. How do you have proper checks and balances? So my approach has been different. And, uh, you know, communication's always been an issue between the uh, legislative branch and the administrative branch. That never goes away. But how do we work together to get things done? We've done exemplary work to make that happen. Our 40 ward plan meetings have really improved the alderman's understanding of what's important, not only in their ward, but as a city as a whole and it's helped the community engage. We go, to, we go to the public and they tell us what they like to see in the ward and as a city as a whole. And we're working together as a city council to improve those initiatives for all of us. Frank Edwards, relationship with the council. Communications, communications, communications. Um, if they understand what you're doing and I understand what they're doing, um, you tend to work together. You don't want to surprise them in the media surprise them that night with an ordinance they'd never seen before. So I was in that slot. I spent a lot of time on the phone working with the aldermen with their bills, working with my bills, so they understood, and it's a two-way street. It always can't be coming from the top, and if you have an open door for the aldermen, um, they feel that they're part of the team. They feel they're part of the solution rather than part of the problem. So it's communications, communications, communications and it isn't always that way because it wasn't that way under me we spent a lot of time and I guess because I came from the alderman slot I saw it I knew what needed to be done and we spent a lot of time talking with people with the alderman back and forth so it's a two-way street okay. my next question starting with Frank Edwards if there were one thing you could change about yourself what would it be well I've always been known as being warm and fuzzy <laughs> No, I, I, you know, I kind of like myself, really. Um, I'm a product of my parents, my grandparents, and uh, they're the designers. And um, with God's help, they, they made me kind of the way I am. And it's not up to me to wish to be something else other than what I am. And God bless my parents and my grandparents and God for, you know, giving me the ability to stand up and uh, not back down when I'm right. And some people take offense to that, but um, I am who I am, and I'm, I'm glad to be who I am. Mayor Langfelder? Well, I had the blessings of growing up in a family at 13, so that adjusted me to the city council uh, and dealing with the public. I mean, it really has. I'm big on self-critique. I don't take things personally. I've had people call me names right there at city council. It's all about discussing the issues and not getting personal. And I just, I'm like, a, you know, I let things uh, brush off because, for instance, uh, the unions. Let's talk about the unions. You cannot let the dog or the tail wag the dog. And that's especially tough when you have a, one of your major supporters go the other direction. That's not easy to do, but I did it. 
And the reason I did it is because it was in the best interest of the city of Springfield. And I always look at how we can, when an initiative goes down uh, by the wayside, I always look, take a step back and said, how could I have approached that differently? It's all in the delivery. So I'm big on self-critique, how we can improve on each and every day as we move forward to serve the people of Springfield. And that's what it's all about. Having determined that both candidates like themselves pretty well, we go to our closing <laughs> statements. Right. Again, by a coin toss uh, before the broadcast began, the first closing statement, 90 seconds, goes to Frank Edwards. You know, our city faces many challenges. We can blame others. We can pretend they don't exist. Or we can face these challenges with skilled leadership and determination to overcome them. I'm no stranger to the mayor's office. I faced some pretty tough circumstances before. With a steady hand, teamwork, I set the course that lowered our expenses and operating costs, build up our fund balance. My vision today is tackle and solve our problems so businesses are attracted to this great city. Have one so our city can be vibrant, be the hub of new ideas, all the while preserving our history. So someday people say, it's a great place to grow a family, have a family, great place to do business, and it also has good government. So I'm asking for your vote so we together can move our city forward. Thank you. And a 90 second closing statement from Mayor Jim Langfelder. Thank you for listening today. This election is about Springfield's future. Do we go back to the same old Springfield of inaction and negativity or continue the progress we have made together for a better tomorrow for all of us? Springfield is thriving and a great place to raise a family. As mayor, along with the city council, we have improved public trust through our 40 ward plan meetings so we all have a better understanding of our community priorities by ward and as a city as a whole. Together, we worked together to do what is best for Springfield. We've invested over $160 million for sewers, streets, and sidewalks to improve our neighborhoods while creating over 1,200 jobs. We've utilized Department of Justice evidence-based best practices, partnered with our community, and through our Springfield community policing efforts have successfully reduced violent crime by over 30% since 2010. Through our proactive measures, we have stabilized city water, light, and power in our position to return CWLP to its primary mission of providing reliable and affordable electricity and water to the residents of Springfield for the foreseeable future. Springfield is the home of our greatest president, Abraham Lincoln, and we should challenge ourselves to aspire to his vision. Under a Langfelder administration, Springfield will continue to strive to be the model city, especially with race relations, economic development, CWLP, and most importantly, trust in your city government. We will not be satisfied until our entire community is thriving together and all our neighborhoods are safe and desirable for everyone to live. I'm Jim Langfelder, and I would appreciate your vote on April 2nd. Thank you. To both of our candidates, thank you for taking part in this issue-oriented forum. To our audience, please show your appreciation to both our candidates here this evening. We'd like to remind you that WMAY and the State Journal Register will be jointly sponsoring a series of aldermanic forums beginning two weeks from tonight on Monday, March 25th, originating from here at the State Journal Register offices downtown. And it'll be available broadcast live on WMAY and streaming at WMAY.com and SJ-R.com. Until then, for Bernie Schoenberg, I'm Jim Leach. Have a good evening.